So welcome to CSC 239. This is Scientific Computing Applications. And I think it's one of the most engaging and interesting courses that we teach in computer science because it shows you how to apply much of what we learn in our degree courses, but in context. So you get a chance to use it in labs, you get a chance to use it for real world situations. And, and that's a part of our uh, course uh, uh, activities, our instructional activities that I, I fully appreciate. Um, one of the things that I will tell you is that the textbook here is actually a very good textbook. And it's, if you do anything in STEM with computing, after this course, you would want to keep it as a permanent purchase because uh, you'll see in a minute that it's, it's very comprehensive. It's designed for graduate students. So I'm telling you this up front. We're going to cherry pick. We're going to, we're going to get the low hanging fruit from that reference. And we're going to use the virtual resources that are provided by the publisher MIT Press. So Massachusetts Institute of Technology has um, published this book, but they've also provided a virtual machine that has all of the tools uh, pre-configured for this course. And that's, that's another aspect of this course that's incredibly powerful, is that they take the stuff in the textbook, and if you download the virtual machine, what you'll find is that there's a one-to-one -one correlation between what you're seeing on the screen in your virtual machine and what's in the textbook. And that's, that's, uh, that's not too common these days. Now that said, there have been challenges every other year I've taught this course because tech changes. Different versions of virtual box render the virtual appliance as it's called, it's called an appliance Sometimes it doesn't load the same way, so there's some kinks. We'll explore that a little later today in the class. Uh, I wanted to call your attention to where you can find our syllabus. And so um, I'll go ahead and, and zoom up in this um, view here because I wanna make sure that uh, you can see this. And I'm actually gonna collapse the bar for a moment. So after I finish updating the PDF version of this syllabus, I'll put a link here, but right now um, I took the link out. I just thought I would mention that. There's a handy reference for my office hours. And when we meet, um, and so uh, essentially the description of the course has been the same description that's been in place for many years. And it was originally a two credit course. And when I was tasked for teaching it the first time and saw the textbook, I, I went back to the curriculum committee and said, oh my gosh, the amount of stuff that you cover in this course, this is a three credit course and we're cheating our students. It is now a three credit course. The reason I bring this up is that it's not uncommon to still find uh, phantoms in our computing system at UVI where a transcript will print, or you'll see a listing of the courses you've completed, and it'll say, it may say, and it has said for some students, why I'm not sure, some and not others, don't have the answer for that. It says two credits for some students, it says three credits for others. Make sure that in your enrollment, in uh, Bucks Connect and especially in BAMWeb that this is reflecting uh, a three credit course, okay? So is everybody on the same page that way? Yes, no, maybe? Yeah. Okay. So it says, develops an understanding and skills in the use of computer applications and software as a tool for scientific work. So when we talk about science, we're gonna be roping in some science concepts along with the tech. And that means that I'm gonna take on the role of a science lab instructor or professor. And I have actually taught as a lab instructor in the sciences for more than a decade in a former life a long time ago. Uh, biology, chemistry, physics, that kind of thing, okay? So there are times where I talk about how to work this screen 
and measurements and so on, you're going to say, well, wait a minute, this is a computer science course, but it actually applies in a variety of contexts. So we talk about being able to enter, edit, and display text and numerical data, right? That's something that you should be able to do. <clears throat> so we're going to assume a certain level of competency with regard to your stuff. Your personal technology, we're going to want to assess if your personal technology is capable of running the virtual machine. The good news is the virtual machine has a very small footprint compared to other virtual machines that you can build. So as long as you have uh, eight gigs of RAM and you have about 40 gigs of extra hard drive space and a multi-core processor for your personal technology, then you would be able to operate your virtual machine with ease after you do some things to prep your tech. Now, how would you assess whether or not you have the right stuff? or enough stuff. I want you to follow along right now on your own personal technology. And I wanna tell you that there are some of the classes where we have where I'm gonna ask you to join the session with your personal technology, not your smartphone. I wanna make a distinction here in this class and in actually in all my classes, a smartphone is still a phone. And you're gonna be doing a lot on screen. So unless you wanna be doing this, zooming in and doing like this to scroll around on a lot of real estate on the back end, it's gonna be very kludgy, very awkward, very slow and painful. Does everybody understand what I'm saying here? So if I say, hey, join us today, we're gonna to be walking through the creation of a relational database system to track the sightings of sea turtles and to analyze the data. I'm not joking, that's literally what we're gonna do. We're gonna build from scratch an application using a common database from start to finish and you're gonna be able to like really use it in a practical way to help track data for sea turtles which I think is pretty cool in a single setting. Now, I wanna to talk to you about our settings. We meet on Tuesdays and Thursdays. This is supposed to be a 75 minute class. And if we're gonna cover everything we're supposed to and really get the most out of our tech this year for three full credits, we really have to run like 30, 35 minutes for first half of the class, take a five minute break, and then run another 30, 35 minutes to finish. I intend to use the time we have in class to that extent, but what I would like to do with your permission is break down the recording sessions into part one and part two, right? So, so what we would have is like 30 minute video and then another 30 minute video with a short break in between. Okay, that way we get 75 minutes worth of good out of our, our whole block. Are there any questions so far? For those of you who have not had me in a course before, I wanted to share with you that when you, uh, if you're missing the class, one thing you can do is to go to the appropriate module. And for example, this is our first module on scientific computing origins and essentials. The module cover page, right, uh, is a summary of what the course module is about. So you get the general description and topics, then the learning outcomes, the reading assignment associated in the textbook, and then the activities. Now, the thing about the activities is that they're intended to be completed in the order they are listed. And if you see the first number of an activity, in our course, and it's 1.5, what that means is that it's the fifth assignment, or it's the fifth, it's the fifth assessment or assignment that you have to work. And here's the number of points that it's worth. And that's your final average. That's the number of points it's worth in terms of your final average for the course. So here's a quick question for each of you. And and I, I want somebody to unmute their microphone and give me the answer verbally. 
if I miss the assessment and just don't do it, and this five points is actually a chunk of your final average, what's the maximum you can achieve if you do everything else flawlessly and get full credit for all other assignments and submissions? If you blow off this five points, what's the max average you can earn in this course? Anyone? 13 points. Say again? 13 points. Well, if we're talking about 100 points for your final average in the course, and, and that's, I'm glad you gave me that answer. Let me clarify a little further. So when you see the assignments and instructional activities and what they're worth, these point values represent the number of whole points that the assignment submission is worth. When you get a hundred points, if you do everything correctly in the semester. So you start with a hundred points. If everybody does everything perfect and you get full credit for everything, you end up with 100 points at the end of final exam week. But if you, let's take this example. If you say, yeah, I did the assignment, I did the solution. Well, let's take this example, the article summary. Let's say you say, I don't like writing. I'm just not gonna do writing. I'm just not gonna do it. And we have some students every year that just don't do it. What's the max average for the entire course you can achieve if you blow off the highlighted assignment you see below on your screen. It's 100 minus what? 95. That's correct. 95 is the highest average you can achieve because if you blow off the one writing assignment, it's a two paragraph assignment, it's easy peasy, then boom, the most you can achieve is 95. That's how we work the scoring and credit in the course. We want to keep it simple. Now, one thing that you'll appreciate is that once we start this process, and by the way, uh, students have previously provided feedback in last semester, and they said, yeah, they really don't want to wait very long to get their scores back. And I used to explain to everyone that you know, in terms of learning psychology and instructional methods, the research tells us that if an instructor scores submissions for different students at different times on different days, there's a consistency problem. And it's obvious because they're in a different setting and a different mood with a different frame of mind. And it's not intentional, but wouldn't it suck if you were the guy that had your work scored when I was grumpy? And wouldn't it be cool if you caught me on a day when I graded your stuff and I was in a really good mood? The, those kinds of inconsistencies can be nullified if we get all the submissions together. Now, I used to let people turn in things when they could get around to it because of their tech problems or whatever. What we've come to decide is that we have to balance this so that people will have about 10 days to resubmit an assignment for additional credit or to get it done if they're having some issues with the personal tech. But after that 10 days, if the deadline that's specified here at the bottom, you know, isn't, I'm gonna update these for this year. So it's usually just a, a day off, right? So in 2023, the deadlines are one day different. Hello. Hi. So what we have is a case where, um, we, we wanna we want to score all of these together. So, that's where keeping your personal technology in a good place is really important. And that's one of the first things we're going to be doing. The tools of scientific computing mean you have a healthy, you have healthy technology to work with, right? So you're, you're going to be at a handicap 30% of your grade or 30 points. You'll notice the solutions. We have hands-on. You do a hands-on solution, which and which means you're setting up the virtual machine, that's your first solution. It's worth five points. It's worth as much as the assessment for this module. But another way, the test for module one is worth as much as the hands-on work that you do with the virtual machine. And, and, and that's, that's in addition to the other assignments. So the other thing I wanna point out is that we record these sessions live like we're doing. And in order to display these assignments and solutions, as they're posted, you have to open 
the module by clicking on the header link. So I know this is highlighted in yellow, but it, it, it's amazing. Every year we go over this and uh, inevitably we have some students that join late in the add drop process and they didn't get, they didn't catch this. But if you click inside here, the module will include references to include a study guide. The study guide will often include an addendum to accompany that. And then there are other videos, right? Now, apart from that, if we go back to module one and get inside here in the resources section, this is where I will post the recordings. Okay, so inside class recordings, you'll find the recording for today, right? Then you might also find some open source references on a method. What am I saying? If you open up this thing, there might be a Khan Academy YouTube on how to work um, a standard deviation quicker, faster, and easier, right? So and those are things we'll get into later. The solution tasks. So a lot of times when you're working your solution, I will pre-record step-by-step with screen instructions what and how to do, and the solution tasks are in the resources folder along with the class recordings. So that's, what, that's how we've uh, framed the resources for this course. Each of the modules is consistent that way. The other thing I'd share with you too, if you're new to our, if you are new to our, or my own um, courses, if this is the first time you've been uh, with me in a class, everything that you have for assignments, solutions, and assessments can be resubmitted. We want you to learn certain things very well. It's called mastery learning. It means that we're going to go back and find out where we screwed something up or had a misconception about a concept. And what we're going to do is give you the opportunity to submit again. So if you get a score back and you don't like it, look at the comments, fix what needs to be fixed and resubmit as quickly as possible. And then we'll post, uh, we'll post whatever, uh, however many points you, you regain. In particular for the assessment, if, if that uh, didn't go so well, you can reconcile your mistakes. That's a process we'll discuss and review if you haven't done that before uh, at another time. And then we'll, because we review the assessment items in, in class. Uh, or I pre-record a review of item assessments. We find out where most of the class did well or not. So the assessments in each module, that's to help you track how your understanding of the material is going. Reconciliation lets you fix it. And then the, the retake allows you to engage another version of the same assessment. It will not be the same there will be subtle differences in the question, which means the answer choices will likely be different half the time. So don't think because you reconciled, you should just, oh, I remember this one, the answer was C. Everybody's assessments have to be done in a certain window. The questions are randomly sorted, so nobody has the same question at the same, you know, same number. And the choices, the answer choices are also randomly uh, scrambled. So uh, we do that because uh, we just want people to be honest about where they are. The fact that you get to do it over, you get to declare, declare a mulligan and do it over again, get the score you want. Um, I have had academic appeals more than once by some students. It has never gone well. <laughs> It has never gone well in front of the committee when the student says, yeah, I deserve an A in the class, I deserve a B in the class. And then I explain, well, but you could have resubmitted for more credit or you could have done so-and-so and, and fixed this issue, right? So put another way, you control the grade you earn in the course. I'm gonna say that again. You are in the driver's seat 
you can say, I'm not happy with this grade. And so you can do things to make up the work. Now, at, in the upper left corner here, you'll see something called My Grades. And if you click into this, you want to scroll to the very bottom of My Grades. I won't show you how to do this now, but we'll do it after our first assessment, the first set of submissions. At the bottom of My Grades, it'll, it'll have two big numbers. It'll say Total Possible and Total Earned. So if you earn 15 points out of the 20 points available in the module, all you have to do to figure out your current average is to divide the points earned. Let's use this example. Everybody can see this, right? Divided by the points possible. Whoops. Oh, let's do it again. 15 divided by 20. So now I had a point. I had a point one. I'm sorry. 15 points earned divided by 20 and then multiply by 100 to get percent. So that's a 75%. That would be a C if I had earned 15. If I want an A, all I have to do is go back, figure out what my scores were based on what's possible, like five points here, five points there, two points there. Everybody get what I'm talking about, right? Go back, mop up, clean up on aisle six, do what you have to do. The return of submissions will happen at a much faster pace. If you've had me before, you'll be shocked if we get to the deadline and 10 days have passed and you hadn't, I send reminders and there's no submission, I will post a zero. It's a wake up call. And because I took a beating for not returning submission sooner, this season, I'm, I'm gonna play tighter on that. Now, the trade-off is last year, students wanted more time to finish submissions. So many students in each class said, hey, I need more time. And I granted more time, but I held off on the grading to make sure that we graded all the submissions together. And that meant that other students had to wait to see what they received. So I get both sides of this, but I don't think what's fair is that I got beat up in the evaluations because on the one hand, students said, oh, I like that we can turn in anything, anytime. And then on the other hand, they said, but it takes too long to get our grades back. I'm like, oh, okay, well, I'm not gonna like grade some of them at 7 p.m. after I have cocktails and I'm feeling good, but I'm gonna grade other ones at eight o'clock in the morning before I've had my coffee, right? I, I hope you understand the trade-off there. I've deliberated about this quite a bit over the summer. And I've told previous classes that I was gonna make some changes, but you know, old habits. This year it's actually gonna happen because we have the additional resources and the additional technology. Um, you're gonna find that I am, the deadline means the deadline, and then 10 days after that, if you haven't resubmitted for additional credit or you haven't completed the thing in the first place, we're, we're just gonna, we're gonna post zero credit. And I, I want everybody to understand that. Now, if there are extenuating circumstances and you send me an email and you say, my MacBook Pro, just got crushed in the parking lot and I don't have anything for seven days, I will certainly work with you on the deadline, okay? But it has to be like legitimate. And if the dog ate your homework, your dog, your canine better be excreting memory chips out his backside in three days, okay? Uh, it's not. Uh, we won't use that example. That's, I'll probably, Probably clip that out of the YouTube before we post it. Um, let's. Any questions so far? Any questions so far? Are we good? Yeah, I'm good. Okay, I'm going to take a screenshot of who's in the session today. And ordinarily, I won't always call out names, but I will capture a screenshot. 
of the participants to list. Is there anyone over on St. Thomas or in St. Croix in classrooms or joining a screen with someone else whose name is not listed? Because sometimes students like watch the class together. Do we have any other names I need to include here? Going once. Going twice. Okay. So that's, that's how I uh, gauge one aspect of participation here. Um, why don't we all just take a moment to stand up and stretch and move around while I'm finishing this? If you don't mind, today is the 22nd of August. And okay. So I can read the rest of this for you verbatim, uh, but basically we're going to be doing a lot of cool stuff with an interest in lab related science, technology, engineering, and math scenarios that often includes measurements of things like velocity and uh, energy content and so on, right? So if you find that the scientific context or mathematics is too extreme and it's left you lost, uh, don't hesitate to let me know, but we will be collecting experimental data, performing essential calculations, and analyzing the results using standard statistical and graphical features in scientific computing applications. We'll also be modeling. We're going to be using the artificially intelligent uh, simulation and modeling features and functions in applications, which I think is one of the coolest things in the world. It's like, okay, uh, the stock market is doing what? What's the prediction for tomorrow? And we're also going to explore those scientific methods in terms of what those things mean, right? So when we say there's uh, qualitative versus quantitative analysis, uh, that there are descriptive um, types of measures, uh, we're going to explain uh, what those terms mean. Here is our textbook. Can everybody see this? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Now, this is provided electronically by MIT Press. And you can rent it for 24 bucks. You're going to need it for the class. We have to go between the textbook and what you're doing in the assignments and the solutions. If you don't have the textbook, you're going to be screwed when it comes down to certain things. Okay. Now, I'm going to ask you at the end of this week to provide me with evidence that you've rented or purchased this textbook. And you can, you can do creative things to meet the requirements of this submission for the assignment uh, without actually renting or purchasing the textbook because it's easy to capture a screenshot when you're previewing or something like that. I wanna discourage you from doing such a thing because I'm going to be asking students to share their screen. And sometimes I'm going to be asking you to show me your textbook on page so-and-so. And it's going to be embarrassing for everybody if we can't do that. If you live on St. Thomas, before Labor Day, I'm going to get on a plane. I'm going to hop over to St. Thomas. I'm going to sit down with you live and in person. And I'm going to ask to see your personal technology. Do not bring your brother's laptop and tell me it is your technology. Why am I saying that? Because there are some students that did that. And then when it was time to do the assignment, they said later, oh, well, that was my brother's screen. I was just borrowing it for the time, OK? We're going to be using this stuff all the way through each module. So we're going to need that tech in place and squared away from the very beginning. But the good news is I'm going to work with you and between the two of us, we'll get you what you need, even if you got nothing to work with, right? That's the good news. Okay. One of the things that I want to share with you about this website is that after you're finished and you either rent or purchase the book permanently, right? If you go to the website, 
there is actually, I think on the website, if we go, got to move this out of the way, a gentle introduction to effective, so that's what I'm going to, books, hello, a gentle introduction to Wow, it used to be so much simpler. You type in that and it would pop right up to the top of this list. There we go. So if we go to the website, so you can purchase it hard copy, you can rent it, right? And the link, okay, so the so basically the link in the in the uh, syllabus should should do this. There are resources. Does everybody see the resources here? Yeah? Yes. Okay. See what's next? Download virtual machine. Yeah? Here's the other cool part. Book data files. So they have data files where they want you to work with data files. You can enter them manually from the book. That's a bore. You know, you don't want to do that. You want to download the book data files and then you just have them and then you do the crunch and munch with the apps, right? So remember that you want to go to the website, you want to search for the title, you want to go to the resources tab, and then you want to download the virtual machine. Now, the last time we tried this, uh, everybody's mileage varies. If you're on campus on the Wi-Fi, sometimes after a certain point of bandwidth, they'll throttle you, depending on the network security and what's going on, right? Uh, do we have anybody that's working from the dormitories? You'll probably get a good result if you do this from a home internet service, any credible home internet service but it is 9.5 gigabytes of data, which means if we're looking at bits, 9.5, let's just estimate, 9.5 gigabytes, that's 1024 megabytes times 1024 kilobytes times 1024 bytes. That's 10 billion, 200 million bytes, but we're not done yet. That's bytes with a Y-T-E-S, which means that it's actually eight times that number of ones and zeros. 81,604,378,000. It's, it's a lot of downloads. So you wanna be on an internet service that has, I don't know, 15, 20 megs of download because those are megabits or megabod, it's not typically expressed in bytes, especially if it's wireless, in which case you're sharing that bandwidth with others in the wireless environment. The thing that I want to share with you is that if you have problems downloading this as quickly as I am in the middle of this class right now, you're going to want to give me a heads up right away that you have an issue. Okay. And you're also gonna to wanna to walk through some simple steps to optimize your personal technology before you uh, work this. Now, <clears throat> I gotta jump back to our syllabus. Does everybody see this new disclaimer that I've added? Does everybody see the screen? Use of smartphones yes. for yes, use of smartphones for instructional activities is prohibited except where assignments explicitly require. You can, in the first half of each module, we cover content and we review the methods before we actually get into using them and working them. During academic sessions where we're simply exploring the ideas, 
it's okay to tag in and watch the video uh, live from our Zoom session. That's, that's fine. But then the second half of each module, when you got to get hands on, that's when you're going to need your stuff. So I just wanted to clarify what that, that statement means. If you do not have a laptop or a credible personal technology device, there are loaners you can sign up from the library. I can help you with that. Send an email and say, just tell them Professor Kentop requires this. And sometimes they can scrounge stuff even when they say they're out. Sometimes, depending on who you talk to, right? Uh, there is another option. You can use a virtual machine. You still have to have a screen, a keyboard, and a mouse to interact with. And we can actually provide you with a Raspberry Pi that you use to remotely access the virtual machine. So the virtual machine is built for you. It is dedicated exclusively for your purpose. Which gets me to this. We've already talked about, as a general practice, no assignment, solution, or assessment may be submitted late or resubmitted for additional credit 10 calendar days beyond the stated deadline. Don't try to submit your article review for three more points because you slapped it around Halloween. Because all I'll do is put on my Halloween mask and say no. OK. Um, it says students are expected to either possess and maintain suitable personal technology for this course or to possess the means to connect to a dedicated virtual system. Are there, are there any questions about that requirement for the course at this time? And I would encourage you after the class, recording stops and we officially close out the class today. If, if you have questions or concerns, you should the sooner is better than later. You should say, hey, uh, I, you know, let's talk options. That's how you start the conversation. You say, hey, you were talking about the personal tech. Well, let's talk options, right? And, and we have resources. So uh, in general, that's one hard requirement that has changed in our course, right? Uh, we do like students to work together, but there are interesting things I want to share a quick story with you. The assignments often require you to do a certain thing where you put your name and then you capture a screenshot. Did you know that sometimes we have students that like to work together, but they like to copy each other's work and then they submit it and it's the other student's name on their submission on that screenshot? I'm just saying, every year, every year, every single year, this happens. So I'm talking up about it up front, and it's a part of this first video for all the students, even if you join later during that drop, <laughs> that you know well, that's a no-fly zone, okay? That's not gonna help. It's actually gonna hurt. So um, that's one thing we would wanna call out. Um, the vast majority of students, 99.9% .9 of students, right? Uh, never see that kind of thing, okay? So what I'd like to do is see how our download is going. And if I look, I can check here. And downloads, and it'll actually give me a status of whether or not my PG book VM 2020.zip downloaded successfully. Now, what was the download size we referenced earlier? Does anyone recall? 9.5 gigabytes, yes. So if I go to my downloads folder, and that's the zipped file, when I unzip this bad boy and then start it up, it's gonna be 20 gigs large, okay? So if I look at my downloads right here, and I look at my PG zip, the $64,000 question is, and I right click and go to properties, will I see roughly 9.5 gigs? I see 9.53 gigabytes. Does everybody see what I just did there? I took the zip file in downloads, I right clicked with the mouse and I selected properties and here I get this result. 
That means I have a successful result. Nine times out of 10, when students are setting up their virtual machine, they don't see 9.53. In fact, I will tell you what you should see on your screen should track with this exactly if you're on a Windows machine, a little different if you're on a Mac, 10,238,605,308 bytes. That's the reading you should get if your download was successful using a Windows machine and you validate the properties of the file. Any questions? So what's the first thing you're gonna do? Because one of your first assignments is to set up your virtual machine. This is what kind of file? A zip file. So if I double click this thing, I should be able to take the OVA file, which is called, it's a, it's a virtual appliance. It's an object for a virtual appliance, OVA. I think the O is for object. I'm gonna copy this and I'm going to paste it. And I'm going to set up a temp file, a temp folder on my C drive. If you don't have one, you can select where it says this computer. I've named my computer so I know when I'm on which screens. I can go into the C drive. I can click on the white space and create a new folder called temp. And that's where I'm going to copy this OVA file into. I'm going to paste it in there. Now, if this is successful, then after it's been pasted, it should, it should be at least 9.53 gigabytes large because it was compressed to put it in the zip file. Does everybody understand what I'm saying there? Yes. Okay. Now, the other thing that I would like to demonstrate and this is good. If you want to check your hardware to make sure that you can handle, your hardware can handle this, on the task bar at the bottom of the screen, what I want you to do is to right click the task manager. So you right click the task bar and select with the left mouse button, the task manager. And as task manager pops up onto your screen, You may have a different view than what I'm showing right here. If you find that you have a view that looks like this, it's because you need to select more details. When you select more details, you should be able to go to the performance tab. And here's where I want you to reference your hardware. In order for you to successfully run and operate the virtual machine for this course, you should have a multi-core processor. That means that the number of cores should be two or higher. So as long as down here it says sockets one, cores two, or four, four is better, right? But it's okay if it says two. The logical processors would be likely twice that number. As long as you have four virtual processors, it means that you can run a virtual machine while you're doing other stuff on your laptop. But it's not recommended that you do a lot of stuff on your laptop. In particular, I will tell you that one of the most common, common <clears throat> shoot yourself in the head kinds of moments is when a student says, Professor Kentop, I need your help. I've done all the things in the video. I've walked through this. I've checked my physical resources on my personal technology. I have 16 gigs of RAM. I have, I have a four core processor that's hyper threaded, which means I have eight virtual processors. I have 16 gigs of RAM. I have plenty of disk space, but it's slow, 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 slow. And the first thing I'm gonna do is say, show me task manager and we're gonna look, how many apps do you have loaded? Now, the thing that's really important to understand are this, these two apps right here. And there should be, I don't have Chrome loaded right now, but if you have Google Chrome and you have Edge or you have Firefox or whatever, these can be terribly problematic because every tab that's open, every single tab that's open on your web browser represents a separate web browser. 
window, a separate instance of the browser. Now, it doesn't present that way on the screen. We're used to that. But what I've known is that some students will open more and more, more and more, more and more. And they just keep clicking, 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 clicking. And what happens is that this stuff just gets nuts. Okay. So I'm going to go to Ask a Librarian. And then I'm going to go back to here. And I'm going to go to the uh, Azure for Education. And then I'm going to go back here. And I'm going to go to here. Oh, and then, you know, I got to get back into Blackboard. So I'm not going to figure out which of these tabs is Blackboard. I'm just going to go ahead and do what? Click on Blackboard again, open a separate thing. Did you know that half the time, if you're on a screen in Blackboard doing a thing, but then you're on another tab in the same window doing a different thing, did you know that sometimes it's a visual thing, right? Does everybody understand what I mean by that reference? Should I stop sharing and do that in video? Maybe I should, right? So you have like Blackboard screen, Blackboard screen. Oh, you're in here on this option, trying to submit, and then you're interrupted. And you come back 30 minutes later and you, oh, where, where did I leave off? And you have 47 tabs, right? So then you, I'm not saying you do this, but I'm saying I've seen some students do this. And if you happen to be one of these students that do this kind of thing, you might want to think twice about, you know, like closing so many tabs. But if you have another tab open and another tab open and it's not working, it's not refreshing, that's because you have multiple tabs open for the same set of resources for the same website and they all get confused. And that's just not how it works, right? So uh, the computer system gets confused. So, so that's the other thing that happens is that if you have dozens of tabs open and each of those represent a separate website. And I'd like to demonstrate for you how that's possible. If I just take the tab and I drag it down, it's now a separate website. It's now a separate web page. 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 Every one of those tabs is literally a separate web browser page. So if there's interactive stuff, if it's a mashup, if there's videos, if there's streaming media on all of those, that streaming media, you can go from like having 16 gigs of RAM to having like, I don't know, two gigs of RAM available. And then you can't run your virtual machine. So I, I just thought I would share with you up front in this first lesson, because ultimately by the end of the week, folks are saying, I can't do it, it won't run, it's not working. And I'm like, mm, yeah. It's not working, let's take a look, let's share the screen. And sooner or later we find out this kind of thing happened, okay? Um, any questions so far? I hope I didn't step on any too many toes. Is there anybody that wants to run from the room? Maybe not? Okay, let's look at our extraction in the temp folder to see how large the OVA file is. So the original zip file was 9.53. I'm, I'm not showing the screen. I appreciate you saying that. Okay, we're gonna share the screen. All right, there we go. Thank you, sir. So now we're seeing 9.69 gigabytes, right? And that's slightly bigger than the 9.53, and that's okay. Meaning we didn't gain a whole lot of space saving by zipping the file, but, but what we did do was put it in a file container that most computer systems will allow to be downloaded, okay? Does everybody understand? If I tried to download OVA directly, a lot of computer screens and a lot of computer systems and a lot of browser downloads, a lot of network security functions might not allow the download of an OVA file because Kali Linux, a hacking tool, can be downloaded as an OVA file. So once we have our OVA file, what we're going to do is set up a separate VHD and a separate VM folder 
and that's just good practice. And then I'm going to download next the virtual box client. Now, if you haven't used VirtualBox before, or even if you have, it's probably a good idea that you follow along these last few minutes. So if you click download VirtualBox, what you see here is an option for Windows hosts or Mac hosts. And this is a Mac with an Intel processor. If you have a Mac with a new, um, if you have a new processor, there's something else you can do to participate with a virtual machine in this course. But if your Mac is an older system, if it's a newer system that has the new RISC chip, the M1 or M2 chips, then, um, then you need to send me an email so we can talk about accessing a remote virtual machine that we built for you, okay? Um, if you run Linux, you can basically load your virtual machine in Linux. I'm going to click on Windows Hosts, and then I'm going to scroll down here to the VirtualBox extension pack. And I'm also going to download the VirtualBox extension pack, which is for all supported platforms. This won't take very long at all compared to the other download. And then one last thing I'll do to make sure I have a clean download is I'm going to look at the SHA-256 checksums or MD5 checksums for that download. And if I'm downloading the virtual box for, let's see, which one did I download? I'll go in my downloads folder. I will... Now we're not quite there yet. We're still downloading. Now we have it. So this is the virtual box. It should, it should read this. So I just downloaded this uh, a couple of days ago. I'm gonna delete this one here. What I'm gonna do is uh, check where it says win.exe on that screen. And I'm gonna, open up something called MD5 SHA. So if you don't have it on your screen yet, you can actually load this or it's called hash tool, hashing tool, right? Hash tool. You can go to the Microsoft store, the Microsoft store, which is probably on your taskbar and you type in hash tool, right? We're gonna be using this quite a bit because with downloads, you wanna make sure you got a good download. And if you didn't get a good download, one of the quickest ways to do that is to check the hash to see, is it corrupted or not, right? So inside here, I'm gonna type hash tool. Any questions so far? We're almost done for the class. Hash tool. Once you have hash tool, you can basically use that hash tool and point to the download to see what its value is and then reference that on your website. So if I look it's not the ISO, it's the win exe. It's this value right here. I'm gonna take this value and I'm gonna copy that, open up Notepad just to keep it handy, paste it into there. Everybody see what I'm doing so far, yes? Yeah, everybody? That's the, yes. That's the value that should be there if I downloaded the, the virtual box correctly. So now I go to here and I look for the, I pull down to do SHA-256 and I select the file in my downloads called 
virtual box, right? Open that. If I wait for it at that point, here's my, here's my hash. I'm gonna copy that, go back to my notepad, paste it in there. And what you're looking for is an exact match. And I have an exact match. That means that my file is not corrupted. Now, another thing that wreaks havoc on a virtual machine setup in simple terms are antivirus programs. If you have additional antivirus programs on your system, you should probably remove them and just run updates so that the Windows antivirus, Windows Defender can work. But I've seen that cause problems. So what we're gonna do at this point, I'm not gonna save this and I'm not gonna do something there. What I'd like to do now is load virtual box, then use the extensions. Then, then I'm gonna go ahead and uh, after I've loaded the extensions, I will import what's in the temp folder. And all of this will take about five minutes. So we'll be able to demonstrate how this is supposed to work for your one of your first assignments. One of your first assignments. Downloading the virtual machine and then for the solution, I'm actually demonstrating the solution for you, right? So what you're seeing here uh, in the recorded video is everything you need to do to finish the first few assignments and basically uh, the solution. So now I'm gonna go ahead and you can double click it, but I would recommend instead, if you have a, an administrative login, you're gonna to wanna to right click it and run as administrator. You get a pop up that says, is it okay to do this? In fact, if you forget to run as administrator, I would actually cancel the install. I've seen this make a difference. I'm gonna cancel this. Go back and run as administrator. Because if you don't run as administrator, certain things aren't gonna load the same. I have seen that one difference mean that, oh, my virtual machine works or it doesn't. I'm gonna hit next, next, yes, yes, install. And then you'll get some flashes and the network will disrupt. And then you have to load your extensions. So what we have now is um, an install that has to play out. And then as soon as that's finished, you'll notice this icon changes so that the extension pack is working. And then in the temp folder, this icon will change because OVA will mean something now. Okay. Hang on just a second. So I'm gonna mute the video for just a moment and I'll pause the recording so that this thing will, should be finished pretty quick. So at this point, you'll see uh, it's time to finish and it says start. We're gonna uncheck that. I'll say finish. And then what I wanna do is go to the downloads folder and load the extension pack, right? Now, once again, this is another copy of the extension pack. I could check the SHA-256 hash. I'm gonna go ahead and load this and we're almost done. So what we'll do on Thursday is cover the first content in the first module. You can um, read ahead. So you'll see this option here. It says install. This will load. I want to scroll down. 
and then agree. And at that point, uh, you can't run the extension pack as an administrator, but uh, essentially once this is finished, then you have the means to import the appliance. Um, I think instead of running up to the end of the class for that part of the process, we'll go ahead and stop here. So when one of your assignments is talking about setting up VirtualBox Manager, uh, this is this is where you would you can do about VirtualBox. You'll see an assignment that asks you to post proof that you have installed VirtualBox properly. It's going to be version 7.0.10, right? So that, that there's actually a 10th release of 7.0. If you show this screen and capture this screen, uh, you'll be able to submit to show that you've successfully installed the um, VirtualBox appliance, the, the application, so that, so that now it knows what to do with the appliance when you want to set up the virtual machine as an appliance. Um, at this point, what I'd like to do is stop and ask, are there any questions about what we've reviewed to this point? What I'd like you to do is to, what I'd like you to do is to go into the, um, I'd like you to go into the Blackboard, uh, module. And then inside the Blackboard module, if you could take a look at module one references and look at the study guide, start looking at the study guide for Thursday, uh, that would be helpful. Um, so at this point, we'll stop sharing and stop.